Hello, and welcome back to Wine Form. So today, I am excited to share with you guys a little bit about the science of fermentation. Before I get too far into it, I want to make it clear that there are three types of fermentation. There is lactic acid fermentation, which happens because of bacteria, and it's how you get sort of a fun little sour beers, and you get kimchi and sauerkraut and things that just taste like a little funky, but it's not a bad funk. There's ethyl alcohol fermentation, and that's how we get booze. So. We know it, we love it. And then there's acetic acid fermentation and that's how we get vinegars. But today we are just focusing on ethyl alcohol fermentation. So fermentation comes from the Latin word fervere, which means to boil. And it was named this because when um, people would leave whatever it was, their fermenting in vats, they would see the appearance of bubbles on the surface. We know now that the bubbles are not from the must or solution boiling, but rather from the release of carbon dioxide gas. Raw ingredients such as fruits, grains, and honey have been left to ferment since the ancient days. We're talking 7000 BCE, source in the description. But it wasn't until the 1600s that we started to understand a little bit more about what was going on. See, early winemakers would um, squash grapes by stomping on them with their bare feet. Little did they know, your skin is a microbiome. For those of you who are interested or know a little bit more about skincare, you've probably heard this buzzword, but it's true. There's a lot of yeast and bacteria that lives on your skin. So when these winemakers were stomping on the grapes, they were actually releasing the yeast on their feet into the must, which was helping the fermentation. There are many different strains of yeast, and they all have different tolerances for how much sugar they can eat or how much ethanol that they can tolerate before they die off. And for winemaking, that chief general family is Saccharomyces. So, back to the 1600s. Dutch businessman and father of microbiology, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, he created a lens which allowed him to see the yeast. Now, with this lens, he saw all kinds of little nasties, such as protozoa, bacteria, and yes, yeast. Now, Leeuwenhoek was actually observing the yeast in beer, but when he looked at it, he thought they were just tiny little particulates of grain floating. He had no idea he was looking at the yeast. 1755 rolls around, and nobody quite realized that the yeast was alive, but they understood it was important and it was what allowed fermentation to take place. Now at the time, they didn't call it yeast, they referred to it as ferment. 1789, Antoine Lavoisier, the French chemist, was experimenting with sugars to observe chemical reactions. He added ferment to a solution of sugarcane and watched what happened. He saw that the outcome became two-thirds alcohol and one-third CO2, but he still didn't quite know where the yeast fit in. 1815, we're learning a bit more. French chemist Joseph-Louis de Lussac experiments with boiling perishable juice and sealing it away from the air to prevent the drink from spoiling. 1835, Charles Cagnard de la Tour, a French inventor, used more powerful microscopes to discover that yeast multiplies. This confirmed that yeast is a single-celled organism and is necessary for fermentation. Now we get to the 1850s. Everyone knows this guy for pasteurization. However, he actually did a lot more for microbiology than the world realizes, Louis Pasteur. He confirmed that fermentation happens because living yeast transforms sugar or glucose into alcohol. And he also figured out that this process takes place without oxygen. This is also why we know now that fermentation is an anaerobic respiratory process. So for more information, in case you really want to go down that rabbit hole, which is actually quite entertaining, I definitely recommend checking out Pasteur's uh, writings, Memoire sur la fermentation alcoolique. And there are many other wonderful scientists who contributed to furthering our understanding of fermentation in all its many forms, especially around the 1940s. Um, but there are so many at that point that I'm just going to put them in the description and you guys can check it out because it's super duper cool, but lengthy. So now let's get to the process. How does ethyl alcohol fermentation work? Well, in the most basic terms, yeast eats sugar, yeast poops, booze and bubbles. But let's get more scientific. First, Let's go back to high school biology. There are two types of single-celled organisms. One is a prokaryote, which uh, 
doesn't have a nucleus. It is the most primitive form of a single-celled organism. The second kind of single-celled organism is a eukaryote. This is the one that has a nucleus and a nuclear membrane, and it's also the one with mitochondria. So for those of you who only remember uh, that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, this is that cell. Sources and learning in the description. So we now know that yeast is a eukaryotic fungus. Other eukaryotic funguses definitely include uh, things such as mushrooms. So, you know, if you're also into that kind of stuff, similar organism. Now, because yeast is a eukaryotic fungus, this means that it is a single-celled organism with a nucleus, a nuclear membrane, and it needs to eat to survive. So what does it eat? Sugar, AKA glucose. But just like we have to break down our food, yeast has to break down its food. So how does it break down glucose? Well, this is a process called glycolysis. Spoiler, this process happens in every living thing, including you and me. It is a metabolic process, so if you're familiar with lamenting over a slow metabolism, I would definitely look into this and you'll learn a bit more. Glycolysis is the process in which one glucose molecule made of six carbon atoms breaks down into two pyruvic acid molecules, which are each made of three carbon atoms. Now this happens using a series of enzymes, including but not limited to ATP, ADP, NAD+. If you work out, you probably heard of ATP because it's what actually primes your muscles to contract, but there are 10 chemical reactions which take place during glycolysis. We're not gonna go into them all. Sources in the description. Now, through glycolysis, the yeast has broken down the glucose into two, two pyruvic acid molecules. Now what does it do? Well, in the presence of oxygen, pyruvic acid will actually transform into tons of ATP, but fermentation is anaerobic, so there's no oxygen. What does it do? This is an anoxygenic scenario, and pyruvic acid has a couple options depending on what kind of cell it is in. In a yeast cell, pyruvic acid converts into ethanol and carbon dioxide. This is how we get booze and bubbles. Now, the whole time that the yeast is eating glucose, making pyruvic acid, which is then breaking down into ethanol and carbon dioxide, the yeast is growing and multiplying like the living thing that it is. However, because it is a living organism, just like complex humans and other animals, it needs ideal conditions to survive. This means that as soon as the yeast has uh, produced a certain amount of ethanol, that waste that they're swimming in actually poisons them and then they die off. So the amount of ethanol yeast can tolerate will depend on the strain, um, as there are many different kinds of Saccharomyces, um, link in the description. The average tolerance is 10 to 15% ethanol. So there you go. So let's make the process of fermentation even more basic, a few steps. Step number one, yeast is introduced to a solution full of glucose. Step number two, yeast eats glucose. Step number three, glycolysis. That means that the yeast is breaking down its food into pyruvic acid. Step number four, pyruvic acid breaks down into CO2 and ethanol. And step number five, too much ethanol yeast dies. And that's how you get booze. Like I said, this is a really complicated thing to wrap your head around. And that's why I have included all of my sources that I use to kind of reintroduce high school biology and further introduce the process of fermentation. With that being said, I wanna thank you guys for joining me here today. As I studied graphic design, I never thought that I would be sitting here talking about microbiological processes such as fermentation, glycolysis, and all that good stuff. But here I am, and you know what? I thoroughly enjoyed it. So if you enjoyed what you saw today, I highly, highly encourage you to give me a thumbs up. Not only are you letting me know that I'm doing something right, you're helping other people uh, actually find my video. So think of it less as doing me a favor, but doing the world a favor and exposing them to some knowledge they maybe didn't have before. If you really like what you're seeing and you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe. I do a lot of things uh, in the world of wine and I will be doing even more as my knowledge expands and my years in the world of wine expands. I have done a lot of wine tasting. I like to give tips on uh, how to pick wine or pair wine with food or um, just, you know, make wine cocktails, do other fun recipe things with wine. And that's not even 
that's literally just scratching the surface. Yeah, I think that's it. So definitely like, subscribe, and uh, hey, if you wanna know when I put out videos, hit the bell icon. That'll give you a nice little alert when my video is out. I put out videos every Friday now, but God forbid something happens and I miss a day, well, now you know. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for uh, going through the process of fermentation with me, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Bye-bye.